background, not dissimilar to Ed. I was a, a scientist in the Hadley Centre here doing climate research for a few years and the scientist at universities before that. But recently I've joined the Met Office Informatics Lab, who are the group that's sort of hosting and organising this event at the Met Office. And actually, it's quite interesting this topic came up at the end of Ed's talk about tools and tools for scientists, because a lot of what we're trying to do is to create a group where to create a group where we can have both these skills in the same group so that hopefully we can start to explore new ways of using and looking at our data. So, so the, the stuff that Ed really teed me up for was uh, talking about how we model weather. And this is, I think, really tantalizing. And, and you know, as Ed said, the laws of physics are known by the computer model. And from these laws of physics emerge all these incredible things. We don't tell the model about what a storm is or what a cloud is, they just happen because it knows these laws of physics, which I find incredible. And you know, some of the visualizations that we were looking at there, I, I find myself lost in looking at. I've studied this data for years, but feel like we still don't really get to see it in all its glory a lot. So in the first project that we took on in the lab, we wanted to look at some new ways of taking this data from the method, from Met Office models and really looking at it in a new way. So I call this journey to the center of a supercomputer because it feels to me almost like we're going inside and looking at this world that we're creating. You know, Phil gets the Tron reference, I don't <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I mean, this is the kind of stuff that exists in a supercomputer, really. There's a little world in there and we want to be able to look at it. Oh, how's my presenter notes? Okay, I'll just have to just have to pick it up. <laughs> so yeah, we take all that cool data. Oh. Is it we take all that cool data and it ends up like this, right? Like these amazing, um, these amazing, in rich models. I mean, to be fair, it looks a bit more like this nowadays, which is, is useful, right, for communicating the weather. But there's a whole, there's this whole world that we lose. So the aims of this project, the sort of exercise that we wanted to go through, we wanted, um, we didn't want to use anything special. So no special computer software or hardware, just something that can be accessible. And we wanted to try and look at all the data, whatever that means, okay? So what we settled on, was using an interactive <coughs> WebGL uh, web browser based ray tracing approach. I know there's a lot of WebGL guys in the audience, so hopefully that gives you some idea of what we're aiming at here. This is the first time, well, it's the first time I'd ever made a web app. It was the first time I've written JavaScript, it was the first time we'd done WebGL. So this was really a journey into the unknown for us. So just, um, I've got some examples of other ray tracing things here, but I might just skip over those because we don't have much time. But just to quickly explain the kind of method. So we saw the grid of the model earlier. So we've got data gridded in three dimensions that changes through time. So ray tracing is this method where you, you take samples through the data along lots of straight sort of optical lines, which is what this thing in the bottom left represents. And by sort of aggregating the data along these lines, you can figure out what it would look like. Okay, so it's basically, for the physicist in the room, it's basically a simple optical model actually. But um, this, is, this has come from a, from a visualization uh, community. So the difficult thing about this is, so I'm just going to quickly go into some of the technical stuff for the people who are interested in the, the FreeJS and the WebGL. So it's easy to know where the rays enter our data set, so the thing that's marked as the, um, the Fs here, but it's quite hard to know where they exit the data set. So the way <coughs> we did this in WebGL was that you can do one rendering pass that's hidden of your sort of your block of data. You color all the, the back points with a, this is with a, a shader routine that runs with the GPU. You color all the back points where the RGB values is actually the XYZ coordinate of the back plane. And then because of WebGL magic that's good at sort of orienting this cube, the color of the point behind the entry point is the XYZ coordinate of the exit point. Okay, so this sort of melts my brain. But basically, long story short, what it's doing is it's using WebGL's knowledge of how stuff orients in three dimensional space to figure out what points sit behind each other. And I just, I just wanted to quickly show you some of the code, not so that you understand the code, but just so that you can see it's not complete magic. So this is code that we wrote to run on the GPU in a web browser. So we'd never written GPU code before and I didn't really know what to expect. The good news is it sort of looks like normal code, right? You can see the kind of stuff here. So that there's a for loop. So the for loop is where one of the rays is walking over the different points, sampling data, it's, uh, it's adding it up into the, calculating some transmission, doing some basic sort of optical calculations. But because this is running on a GPU, there's sort of some GPU magic that means this runs for each pixel simultaneously. 
Okay, so this, uh, it was really interesting trying to optimize and debug this code because it seems to happen in an, an utterly different way from any code that I've written before. So there's another really interesting challenge, which is each, for one field, for one forecast from the Met Office supercomputer, that's five gigabytes of data, and that's already compressed, right? So how do we get that into a web browser? And the trick is this, that we've got five gigabytes of data, but we've got way less information, okay? So the trick here is all about getting the information, whatever that means, which, you know, this is an application-specific term, getting the information out of the data, and then, um, the way we did that is by piggybacking on work that people like you know, YouTube and Netflix have already done. So hopefully this video will play. Okay, so this is the actual data when we send it to the browser. So this video is playing in the background of the browser. You can't see it. It gets pumped onto the graphics card where we run those shader routines on it and that turns it into the visualization that we see. So I mean, I don't know if you can see what's happened here, but we've taken all the slices of our weather model uh, vertically, and we tiled them next to each other, and also through the RGB space, so red, green, and blue has nothing to do with actual color. It's just, it's a way of injecting data into a video. But the, the great thing about this is that over our already compressed data, we get another 400 times compression ratio, so this turns a five gigabyte video into a 10 meg video. Uh, sorry, five gigabytes of data into 10 meg, which means we can now put it in a web browser. So, um, and, and the video codecs are optimized for not losing visual data, right? That, that's what they've been designed for. This is a visualization, so actually, this has kept the stuff that we're interested in. So now I'm going to do a live demo. Oh, thank you. So, So this is the thing that we came up with. So that, how long ago did we do this? Like two years ago or something like that? A um, year and a half ago? So it's an animated uh, volume rendered 3D visualization. And this, this really sort of pushed, at the time, it, we couldn't find many other people who tried to do something where they animated um, volume rendering like this. So this is sampling the video regularly and taking those video frames with the graphics cards. So this led on to sort of some spin-off projects to do, um, so we've got a version where you can fly through using the accelerometer and a version where you can look at it using Google Cardboard to, to get the kind of the 3D effect of the data. Um, I think the last thing I want to say, I'll, I'll stop taking some questions now because we're late for the coffee break, but the last thing I wanted to say was, um, touches on some of the stuff we were talking about with Ed, which is I think in the scientific community sometimes, we become blinded by, um, quantitative analysis of our data, and we never think about qualitative analysis of our data. And uh, I, I think that there's, there's room for us to really get, especially with big data sets now, to be able to get a feel for data sets and get an impression of them. The qualitative stuff, uh, sorry, the quantitative stuff is always going to be the foundation of the papers. But I think that this isn't just about public outreach. Uh, this kind of work is also potentially the kind of stuff I think can change the way the science is done as well. So I'll leave it there and the Thank you.